I was really lucky when I was should have been going to college. I had the opportunity to go ocean sailing with my my family doctor and his wife and five of their eight kids and the family that built their boat. And I got the most miraculous opportunity in that. I learned how to do celestial navigation. This was before sat nav or GPS was around. I, and then I, uh, with that skill, was able to get on various vessels as crew. So I sailed on a real Chinese junk, uh, a, a Jim Brown trimaran, a ferro cement gaffery catch, a gorgeous Sparkman and Stevens wooden yawl, and in addition to the Cascade 42 that I started out with and sailed mm -hmm. to the Galapagos, got to spend five weeks there and into the South Pacific and up to Hawaii. My last passage was 43 days and at that time I was so hooked. All I wanted to do was figure out how I could get back to sea. And I came back to, uh, to, to my native state of Washington thinking that I would learn to be a boat builder and build a boat and go to sea. And I found my closest friends from the year of college I went to the University of Puget Sound involved in a communal boat building project. Mm -hmm. So I joined in and my part became learning how to and helping make the sails. And as a quick aside, the oldest of us was 23. We built a beautiful boat. We launched it. We cruised in BC for several months. We came to Point Hudson because another communal boat had sailed up the coast here to rig their boat and get ready to go. We all fell in love with Point Hudson. We, we were able to open these buildings, start businesses. We started the first wooden boat festival. And it was just the right place at the right time for being in this community and being able to pursue a trade that I was much more suited for, sail making mm -hmm. rather than boat building. Uh, these buildings were basically derelict. They had been shuttered for decades. It was um, originally a customs base and then during World War II it was Coast Guard um, mm -hmm. base. I found out later that my uncle actually served here and my dad mm -hmm. was out at Fort Worden during World War II of all things. Mm -hmm. And when I told my dad I was thinking of opening a sail loft and staying in Port Townsend, he said, why would anyone want to live in that godforsaken windy blowhole? <laughs> anyway, we all know how beautiful it is, but mm -hmm. these buildings were available to us at a very, very reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. So I, at that point, um, my, I had done some sailing with my communal boat friends and decided I really wanted my own boat. Mm -hmm. So my idea of how to achieve that goal was to in my naivete, start a business, and don't you know, in two years' time, I'd have the boat and all the money to go offshore cruising, and so I actually lived under a cutting table here. It was a big plywood table with a cutout for a sewing machine, and there was a little curtain around it, and I lived in here for two years, and 
worked really hard to get the business off the ground, and uh, I didn't have a family or a mortgage then, so it was pretty easy to just stay with this. All of a sudden, I realized that I had this gift of having work that I loved, a community I wanted to be a part of, and the chance to go sailing in the ocean with, with friends, and then later, it became um, chances to go sailing in the ocean doing sail trainings. I've been able to have a boat locally to sail and then do more ocean work in that venue and still have work that I love. So I, it was pretty hard to walk away from that plus this perfect location right on the water with all these windows and yeah. all of that. So <clears throat> I've just stayed 34 years now, which is <laughs> okay. So drive home maybe. Take a while to get around. Okay, there you go. One of the beautiful things about living in the Pacific Northwest, and maybe in this time in history, is that not only can a woman start a business, period, but she can start a business in a formerly male dominated uh, arena. And in addition to that, I have a female partner, domestic partner. Nikki, who works with me, and we've just never felt anything other than love and acceptance from our community of Port Townsend, our wooden boat community, the broader cruising community, it's a non-issue. I always love to say that um, all of our customers are circumnavigators, at least in their minds. That's, they usually have come to us because they want a robust blue water sail that can take them around the horn or around the world if that's what they are going to be able to do and most are, are preparing for that. So depending on the rig, it could be sloop, cutter, catch, yawl, schooner, um, they're going to require different sails for different wind speeds. Mm -hmm. So with that, we determine what we call their minimum number of sails to take them safely from calms to gales. And that would be for really light air, for storms, and then for moderate winds. So it ends up being four or five on a single masted vessel and more sometimes on a multiple masted vessel. And then we'll measure down to the deck, we'll measure to the base of the mast depending on, you know, because you've got this nice little pilot house set up here. And then we'll measure to where we're going to sheet it and then, we're, then we'll be able to then come back and fill this space with a sail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Basically, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah, exactly. It, I, usually, although a couple of our crew are 
completely capable of this. We'll go down to the boat and measure the vessel from stem to stern. We hoist the measuring tapes aloft with the halyards. We don't actually usually have to go aloft, although sometimes we do. And we keep that data for, well, we've got stuff from 34 years ago, so we keep it on file. And with those numbers, we can build any sail for their rig any time, unless they do a rig change. And that sets us up to build whatever they need new, or to rebuild, recut, um, and strengthen, reinforce, et cetera, any sails that they have that are worthy of that process mm -hmm. to get them ready to go. So once the, once the measurements have been taken, I sit down at my desk and by hand, I still prefer to do it by hand, I do a scale drawing of the rig with all the sails that we'd recommend. So once the measuring's done, we've got a whole form filled out here that tells us uh, all the details we need to know about the head sail, the roller furling system, the color of the cover, which way it's going to spool on, um, our sheet lead options, our uh, pulpit height, and then I can represent that in the drawing. I come back and with the scale ruler and a few tools, actually physically draw the boat. So for example, Here's where the roller furling drum is on that boat and the bow pulpit. And here are the sheet tracks, our Genoa sheet lead options there. And this would be the staysail sheet lead option, mass pulpit, boom, that guy's dodger, his bimini, um, and then of course just the basics of the rig, mass boom, stays, and so on. Sometimes we have to work just from the sail plan and we don't have a boat to measure. It's a little nerve-wracking. We'd much prefer to actually physically measure the boat. And then I draw the sails on it that we're going to build. And from that, I create what's called a production form, which is this guy. It's next. And the production form is going to tell us all the details we need to know for this particular main sail. And that's going to show number of battens, where they're whether they're full length or standard, where the reef rows are going to be, what kind of slides are going to attach it to the mast, all that sort of thing. So when that looks good, it goes into the design process where Makaya inputs the data onto the screen or, and builds a mold in space that allows us to see the shape of that sail from aloft and alow, fore and aft, as if we could walk or fly around that sail while it was sailing. We want these sails to fit and set perfectly when they come out of the bag and if we don't measure carefully and double check each other and have the design double checked by our friend Sandy Goodall, who I think we spoke about earlier, our, our design genius, who makes sure that we're right on the right on the money with the shape, then then we go to the machine and we start cutting fabric. CAD program that tells the CAD cutter the shape of every panel, so when we sew it together, the shape is absolutely correct. And then we re-ferret with these long fairing battens, so we lay it out on the floor. We, um, we put the reinforcing patches in the corners, which are also cut by the CAD cutter, and those are five and six layers thick and a certain percentage of the length of each side of the sail. And that will then support the hardware that gets attached to the corners, which in turn then gets attached to the rig. So those have to be sewn in properly and have you know, enough layers and that sort of thing. And then as soon as the reinforcing patches are on, then we tape the edges. And sometimes that involves uh, a left tape with bolt rope. Sometimes it involves a tabling, which is what sailmakers call hems, where you're actually turning the fabric over, increasing it, sewing it down. machine work is done, then it goes in for the handwork. And the handwork is really something that sets us apart uh, from many other lofts. And 
the reason that we do so much of the finishing of the sail by hand is because it's stronger, it lasts longer, it's something that can be repaired at sea. It's pretty easy to look at that and go, yeah, it's just stitched in. And with a palm and needle, which is a sailmaker's ancient tool, we can build a stronger corner, a stronger edge, a stronger attachment point than you can doing anything with just a lot of shortcuts that are taken now in modern sailmaking. Mm -hmm. so, so our goal is to build a sail that's not only more durable than other sails as they're built today in a production lot, but more maintainable. Mm -hmm. So we hand stitch leather around the corners to protect them from chafe. That's something that's meant to be replaced periodically. And the sailor can say, oh right, I see how that works. You know, they can use the piece of leather as a pattern for the new one and the old stitch holes and just put it all back together. So, so that's our goal when we build these sails, is that they're ready to make a, a circumnavigation or a Cape Horn crossing with as few repairs as possible, if any at all, and that when it does come time to repair the sail, because the way we built them, it's a repairable sail, not something that is not worth fixing. I usually have five jobs going at once. Yeah, and then we all take turns detailing to make sure everything's happening right, so each one of us knows what should be on the sail, and we go in and look it over to make sure that it's happening in the right order, and every piece is on that was ordered, and all the leathers are on the corners, and everything's done properly. Cool. So we have an awesome crew right now. We are very lucky. They're hard workers. They're motivated. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> because we do more labor, we get the very best materials available because there's no point in doing all this work if, it's, if it isn't with the finest fabric and the finest hardware and those things that are the equal to the longevity that we expect out of the construction techniques. And then we build the sails here from start to finish, and that's rare in modern sailmaking. Most sails now are built in the China Sail Factory or in Sri Lanka or in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And they're made by names that are, quote, household names in the, in the boating world and are assumed to be built in this country, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So there are a handful, maybe half a dozen of us on this coast and half a dozen on the East Coast that actually build sails from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So those things, building on this coast or building in this country with that kind of end product or you know, drive the price up. So it's one of those you get what you pay for things. This is Allison. I'm Al this is Kelsey. <laughs> um, co workers here at Port Townsend Sales. Um, we were hired within six months of each other, and Kelsey's been here four years. I've been here about three and a half. Um, and we're both building, on our off time, we're building sales for our own boats. Mm -hmm. um, I have a Dreadnought Tahiti Catch, it's a 32 foot catch rig boat, and then Allison has a Downey 32, which is a cutter rig. So basically, full suit for both the sails. Or, well, you have jib, staysail, and main done, and I'm working on a Genoa and a main for my own boat. And so we're working on full suits for offshore sailing. So both of us are planning on going offshore on our boats. We both live with our husbands on our boats. It's a little creepy. And then we both Married while we've been married. Right. <laughs> Before I had bought my own boat, uh, a family had loaned me their gorgeous little wooden yawl. When I would sail the boat, it didn't matter who I was with. I usually have different friends along, some of whom were male, and eventually someone would row over the boat and go, what a beautiful boat, and thinking the guy owned the boat, which was understandable, and the guy would say, well, it's her boat, and and the, and the questions would continue to be asked through the guy, you know, and, and the guys that I was sailing with weren't necessarily sailors, didn't know anything about the boat, so then, anyway, it was just sort of this ridiculous thing, so I decided when I got up the gumption to start this business that I would only hire women, they'd have to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> and now, of course, it, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Thirty years have gone by, and Yep. You know, it's not even in the realm, but that's a consideration. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. And, I mean, even just the access to all this stuff of materials and equipment um, to do what we're doing. I mean, it's, it's to, of building our sales, of building up our, our knowledge, and Posse's just so 
giving with that. It's even though she knows we're gonna leave to go cruising. <laughs> I live on a boat in the woods. <laughs> yes, it's true. We have a view of the water if you walk like, you know, fifty feet in one direction. It's actually so the same land you got married it on. It is, it's the same land I got married on. Yeah. Um, so my husband and I originally had a twenty foot boat. It was called a flicka. It's kind of a just the cutest little twenty foot boat you can imagine. But we decided that maybe that wasn't a a good long term plan. It had standing headroom in it for him and I could stand in it but not him. And um, and so we ended up buying a, our 32 foot boat that is a bit of a project. I mean, I, there is no plan. I, we, you just can't. You, you can't know what's going to happen or what's out there. And I'm just looking forward to some time off and Sweet. however long that is. Yeah. Whether it's a year, or three, or 10, or 20, you know, who knows. And I would say about working with other women uh, that uh, I think there's a very concerted effort to have compassionate and clear communication. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very concerted effort to really make an impeccable product. Mm -hmm. The eye for detail and the concern about it being excellent is really a big part of the culture here. And I think a big part of that is, not necessarily, but I think a lot of times women are a little bit more focused on that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. Carol's really, really generous, I feel like, especially um, generous with what she teaches us. and. Um, uh, I think the two of us in particular, but really anybody who's willing to learn, you know, she she'll she'll take she'll us, give you and do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, she she'll will give, give you any tools, any information. She'll bring books out. Uh, yep. Just kind it's of just more totally than you open. can listen, really. It, exactly, <laughs> and, and that's kind of what it is, <laughs> and that's how almost overwhelming it is for Hossie. You're mm -hmm. like, God, how much can I take? How much can I absorb? Because it, there's not enough time, or it, there isn't enough. You'd have to live the life that Hasi did to absorb all that information that she has. Yeah. Hasi is a gem. She's so compassionate. She treats her employees with respect. She treats her customers with respect. Yeah, she's the top. I wouldn't have been here for 28 years if she wasn't, if she wasn't here. This is a family, definitely. This is a wonderful town, and I haven't ever worked for a better company. I've done a lot of jobs in my life, and um, it's just, um, it's just a beautiful company and family and that's how Posse hires people in. It's not necessarily about the training and you do have to do it. It is a physical job. It is one of the most physical jobs I've ever done. Port Townsend itself is just a sailor's town. Just hands down. It, in, the turn of the last century was second only to New York City in the amount of customs clearance it did, second only to San Francisco in size, and this whole waterfront would be full of lumber schooners waiting to be towed down sound. And rather than Port Townsend becoming what Seattle has become today, it had to shut down for a period of years. The railroad that was supposed to come to Port Townsend ended up going to Tacoma, and steam was coming uh, online, you know, with screw-driven, steam-propelled vessels that could tow the sailing boats down sound. Because the reason Port Townsend was so important to sailors is the first deep water harbor with a relatively good anchorage that you, when you should come down the Straits of Juan de Fuca to stand on an island and not be set with not only strong currents, but no wind. So you could actually sail here, drop the hook, and safely get out of here under sail. So, so at the turn of the last century then, when the news of the railroad not coming here happened, everybody was laid off. When I moved here in the 70s, the top floors of the buildings in downtown were, there were still carpenter's tools of that era lying around, unfinished, just the stud walls. And, and uh, it, it, for some reason, came to draw a lot of people who were interested in trades, in art, in music, in writing, just overwhelmed and inspired by the natural beauty around. We've got 360 degrees of snow-capped mountains going on with the Olympics and the Cascades and San Juans are right there and all of this open water available for sailing and it's just it's just a dream come true for people who love hiking and sailing and that sort of thing. And, and it is so godforsaken when you blow a hole out, I will admit that, and a lot of times in the year it's not real comfortable to be out on the water. But we can sail year-round here, unlike in New England. And the water's cold, so it really serves um, wooden boats. And Port Townsend has arguably become the wooden boat capital, certainly of the West Coast, if maybe not the nation really, at this point. So we have incredible 
nonprofits between the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building, our Wooden Boat Foundation, our Northwest Maritime Center, our Marine Science Center, Centrum, which is out at Port Worden that produces jazz and chamber and fiddle tune festivals and, and artists and writers symposia. And there's a beautiful woodworking school out there now for fine, you know, cabinet making. So there's a real celebration and appreciation of, of trades and a lot of over-educated craftspeople <laughs> that are here doing something that's more satisfying to them than sitting in a cubicle, for example. So they're working with their hands and, and we all, I think, in a big way inspire each other <laughs> to do better and better work. become is a place to bring your boat of any type, steel, glass, wood, whatever style of wood construction to be refit or, or worked on in any way whatsoever, the skills are here. So that's a really exciting thing. It's yeah. exciting to be a part of it. Our plan today with Rich and Lynn on their beautiful boat that they're about to take over the horizon into the South Pacific and beyond is to take a look at the sails that we've built them and most particularly today the cruising spinnaker, which can be a bit of a handful. So we're pretty excited in this bit of a breeze to go out and set that sail flying all together and working out some protocol of how to get it up, get it down, get it drives, and otherwise enjoy its any wonders. Yeah, looking up at this sail, it's just a perfect airfoil. And the, the deepest part of the sail, the draft, is way forward of the center line. And, uh, when I first got this sail, I just went out on the deck underneath it, laid down and looked up at it, took a dozen pictures of it, and it was just so exciting to have a sail up. It was really this nice. Well, I'm the Waterfront Programs Manager at the Northwest Maritime Center and Wooden Boat Foundation, and Hasi was one of the founding members of the foundation and started the Wooden Boat Festival and then they use the money from the festival to run programs for the community, so community sailing programs. So all of our maritime educational programs have grown out of that humble beginning over 30 years ago. So she's been the heart and soul of the festival and the foundation. She's uh, obviously a highly skilled sailmaker, best in the world. And uh, I have a Hussey sail and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> it increased my boat speed. Um, immediately and uh, she's just been sort of almost the patron saint of the program part especially of the Wooden Boat Foundation and the Maritime Center. So anything we need, any encouragement, any uh, equipment, any instructors, you know anything that she can do to help she's always been a, a big part of that. When the movement began to build the Northwest Maritime Center there were really mixed feelings. It was a challenging and huge undertaking and again she didn't look sideways. She said, well, if this is going to happen, let's make it as great as it can be and make certain that it's going to serve as large um, an area in the community that it can serve. And, you know, I can see her touch in all of that. And when it became pretty contentious to build that place, it was Hasi who was um, one of those elements that brought um, different perspectives to the table to really talk through it and see why this is a good idea for everybody. She's that kind of girl. I'm one of the original board members still living here in Port Townsend 
who started our Wooden Boat Foundation, the Wooden Boat Festival. And the idea of it initially was it would just be a celebration of beautiful wooden boats and all of the vessels that we knew on this coast from Vancouver Island, from South Puget Sound, and anywhere else they wanted to come, would come together here in Port Townsend, and we would showcase um, some of the local marine trades people, but more importantly, it would be to share information and share this joy and beauty of, the, of wooden boats and keeping them alive. Well, it was just a fabulous success, and one of the things that a lot of us had envisioned was that it would be that festival not only an educational opportunity in and of itself, but something that would fund other programs throughout the year. Mostly youth sailing was what we had in mind. And we pictured this whole beautiful little marina and harbor as a campus for that sort of educational experience. On the water, in classrooms, hands-on, with rigging or sail making or boat building, and then going out and learning how to, to use a sounding lead to determine your depth and all those sorts of classic mariner skills. So it took a lot longer to have that come to fruition, um, but there was always an element of that from day one because it just seemed like a crime for kids to grow up here and not be on the water. That's, and a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do that, including myself. I grew up on the Columbia River and never got to go sailing until I was 20. And I wanted to go, and I suspect there are a lot of other kids who would love that opportunity to be on the water. And my favorite thing that we do is that every kid in Jefferson County who's in the eighth grade has a three-week course curriculum through the high school, through the public schools, and any private schools in Port Townsend that want to participate as well. They spend um, their math classes doing navigation. They spend their history classes doing first contact, how it was at the early explorers came and met the native people here and they do uh, science through the Marine Science Center and then they go out in the longboats which are replicas of Captain Vancouver's longboats that did the exploration of Puget Sound. Because we have this facility they actually build a boat in those three weeks in our uh, maritime center and then at the end of it they're doing art and poetry and boat building and skills on the water. At the end of that their parents come and see this sort of multimedia presentation, the books that the kids have made, the poems that they are willing to read, and then they're videotaped and they're on screen, and then a little, a little uh, race where they run across the Compass Rose courtyard and they chart uh, a course and they tie a bowl in and run back, you know, so, they, so their teams are playing games against each other. It's just a joy, and the parents are all lined up on the, on the railings, some of them having never been in the new facility yet, or some of them not realizing that it's the whole thing was built for the public, and it's very exciting now. It's coming together in a way that I've just, we've been dreaming of for a long time, and, and should anchor Point Hudson and these buildings as something that won't be turned into condominiums and turned into chain restaurants and actually will be celebrated for the unique historical buildings that they are and what they can house now that's that relates to the marine trades and our youth. You know, what a rich and wonderful <laughs> time to, to have come out of high school, you know, 69. And so I went to the University of Puget Sound, but that first semester, all sorts of questions came up for me, like, what is this country that I've learned to have the greatest faith in its values and integrity doing in an illegal and moral war and oh there maybe were some other ones that we weren't told about so i ended up spending quite a bit of my time um, protesting the war as you know peacefully just everything was opening up for question and so i was feeling pretty primed when the tragic situation at kent state happened and young people just like myself who were peacefully protesting were caught by other young people who thought they were doing their job, shot and killed, and I thought, you know, I'm going to hitchhike around the world till I find a country whose politics I can relate to. So I took my summer earnings and took probably one of the last propeller flights from Vancouver, BC to London, Icelandic air, and then started hitchhiking all over Europe and the Middle East, and got about as far as Iraq and Syria, and just things were getting a little dicey, and I decided that. Um, I wasn't going to, if I got back here alive and not leave my home country till I really 
felt it fully. Like I wanted to climb Rainier and hike the Crest Trail from where I got Canada. So I came back and did those things. It was just part of the time when you got to choose what you wanted to do. You got to look at it and say, women can do whatever they want. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're straight or gay. It doesn't matter if you're black or red. It doesn't matter if you're American or if you're South American, you know, U.S. American or South American. The, it's important that the whole world have an opportunity of self-expression because that's our best hope for peace and creativity and you know, building the world we want to see. When we built our boat, we lived in a lovely hippie commune up in Bellingham. It was just hilarious. We had a farmhouse that we rented with a boardwalk to two geodesic domes and one teepee and off to the boat barn. And I lived in the say loft, or the hay loft, when I come home from the weekends from working. We were building the boat in the barn and the tool shed was off to the side. Our hot tub was a cloth loop tub that we would actually build a fire under. And it looked like we were a bunch of cannibals, I'm sure. But, uh, we had a very responsible group of young people, though, who just, you know, we tracked our hours, we took turns with all of the grocery shopping and galley duty and the whole thing while we were building the boat. And we're all still friends, and when the boat was sold, we all got our money back. None of the, our time, of course, but that's boats. When I went out with Hasi, I think it was 78, we decided that um, the nuclear submarines could be stopped if we got a flotilla and blocked the entire bay with small boats, which we did. It didn't occur to us we couldn't do that. Many of those boats were sailed by women, but I didn't know until years later how unusual that is, because that's just the world I lived in, and it's the world she introduced me to. But the problem with my full-size guitar, when I opened it up, between the guitar and the case, there was no room down here, so I had to build me this half-size. It's got a sweet sound, doesn't it? <laughs> and there is Lorraine, sailing in Desolation Sound. My favorite place in the whole wide world. I have something called a Nordic folk book. I had this, this firm belief that boats choose us, we don't choose them, and I knew when I saw it that that was my boat. And the reason was I had sailed on one through all the islands of Hawaii, which is very rough sailing, very uh, big waves, close together, a sea state that would make anyone seasick, big winds, funneling through the islands in the middle of the ocean there, and I knew the boat could take it. So all these lovely 25 foot long, lap straight, copper riveted, boats that are so strong and seaworthy were meant to be race boats and club cruisers and, and youth sail training boats in Scandinavia have proven to be really good ocean boats other than their obviously diminutive size and you know lack of creature comforts but that said I feel more comfortable in something I can manage myself so it has no through all fittings it has it's just a simple simple boat that's a joy to sail being in this boat and taking the helm and it's like I imagine if I were a horse rider it would be like being on um, in train with that that horse that you love the most whose body works best with yours and that's how that boat feels when you sail it's just such a joy to me there's no gr greater or more magical human contraption than a sailboat unless it's a musical instrument there's just some transport that occurs when we're when we're on the water just in harmony with the wind and the waves and the, and in the present moment in ways that very few things can allow us to be and in a in a really intimate relationship with nature and with whomever we're sailing with the the connections that we have to each other when we're sailing to the water to the wind to ourselves are just such a gift, such a gift. And it's very green, you know, once, once the sails are up. Well, we had built a boat communally up in Bellingham with our friends, and there was another communal. It's a real folk boat, huh? Yes, it's a real folk boat. You know them. It was probably built in my hometown. This one was built in Middle Fart. Oh, I thought it was built in Denmark. Yeah, Middle Fart, Denmark. Well, Middle Middle, yeah. Middle Fart. Yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Best, 
Best boats ever built. This happens all the time. Nice lift. Let's do this for a minute. about this will be a very short tack about again. Came to pass when I was um, getting the company started, living upstairs under the cutting table, and I I didn't have two nickels to rub together to get her a nice birthday present. I wasn't even sure I could afford to call her long distance, and uh, I decided I would call and tell her I was naming the boat after her, and that made her birthday. So, so the only problem of naming a boat after your mother is you can never sell it. <laughs> Not that I want to sell this boat. Well, I grew up in a stinky little mill town called Camas, Washington, down on the Columbia River. I was the oldest of four kids. The view from my bedroom window looked out over Mount Hood and the Columbia River Gorge and this beautiful, beautiful scenery. And right from the start, I just wanted to be in it. I wanted to be on that river or in that river or in the mountains beyond it. And I just... Uh, was compelled by the beauty to want to be a part of that. So as an adult then I could make those choices, which I think my dad inspired me in a way that he might not have expected. I, I appreciate so much his personal integrity and his commitment and his responsibility that he shared with us, but he didn't, he wasn't a real happy camper. He didn't really like his work and he inspired me to find work that I would love. I do live out of town on a little five-acre piece. I, if I could live several lives at one time, I would love to have an orphanage that did sail training. I'd love to be full-time mountaineering and homesteading and, and organic farming, but I hope to, as years go by, um, be a lot more capable of growing more of my own food something that's had to be sidelined a little bit. Our gardens are fairly pathetic, but we're working on it, a little orchard and a garden and that sort of thing. I feel really fortunate that I get to do what I love, the community I love, and feel like I'm contributing in some small way to the marine trades and our legacy as mariners in the Northwest. And really, the beautiful thing about offshore cruisers is that's a whole other community that spans the globe. and it's a joy to feel like we're contributing in some ways to that and that knowing that the people that leave this country on a sailboat are some of the best ambassadors we can have. <laughs> so I, I like that part of spreading the peace and you know this kind of human connection.